Good morning, Life Church family. Who would have thought that we would have been worshiping together um, like this today? But I'm so thankful that we can, with today's technology, come together and have a time of worship with you in your homes today with your families. And I encourage you uh, in the crazy times that we're living in today that you take this opportunity and teach your children, gather with your family, and show them that we can have church right here in our homes and we can feel the spirit of the Lord move and his presence and he can minister peace and strength to us. So we look forward to worshiping with you today and as we enter into this time of uncertainty, one thing is certain, we can stand on the word of God and the promises of God. We have a choice to make while the world goes crazy and is depending on themselves we know that we can depend on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can depend on his word. Um, the scripture says, my God shall provide all of my needs according to his riches. We've never been self-dependent, but we depend on the Lord our God, for he is faithful. And we have a choice of faith or fear. And at this time in our lives, we're choosing faith. We're choos choosing to believe that the Lord is with us. His protection is with us. We are blocking out every voice of the enemy that would sow confusion and fear into our lives. And we are looking to his word in this time. And um, the other verse that I thought of this morning was in Psalm. It says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And we can take rest and hope and peace from the scriptures in this time and speak faith to our families, to our children, and just believe that God is in control of it all. Amen. So right now we're going to go into a little time of worship, and I encourage you just to close your eyes, worship like you're in church, teach your children how to worship in the home, and let's provide an atmosphere where God can speak to our families and where God can strengthen us and speak to us and give us um, power and anointing to minister to a world who is open to answers and who are looking for answers and peace during this time. Let's be the church. Let's let God use us and let's let him fill us right now with his spirit and his peace. Amen. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow.
Good morning, Life Church family. We're happy to be in your homes today, and we're praying that your homes are sanctified as a house of worship. When you look in the book of Acts, you will notice that uh, they worshiped from house to house. They weren't really dependent on a church building to be the center of their faith. And so today we're praying that your home, the most intimate and important place to your family, would be the center of your faith today. Now I want to read a verse that has to do with where you are in your home today and what's going on in the world. Psalm chapter 91 and verse 10 says this, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's talking about your house. It says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And I want to remind you today that there are angels that God has positioned to put in charge of your home and no evil and no plague shall come upon your home. I want you to claim that promise today in your house of worship, which is your home. Now we wanna also remember in prayer today those in our church who are going through difficulties. We do have people that uh, are dealing with grief, some that are dealing with sickness in their body and some family issues. So we want to remember our brothers and sisters in prayer. And if you're doing great, thank God for that, but understand that there are others that need your prayer. Now, as you know, this has been a very interesting week and we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but let me just share with you that uh, the Covina School District uh, on Friday canceled all rentals and gatherings temporarily due to the, the COVID-19 or the coronavirus and to uh, stop the spread or try to halt the spread thereof. So we are working through the details of what our weekend gatherings are going to look like. And it's a situation that has been changing moment by moment. Obviously, we're seeking to be responsive to government mandates uh, in their effort to control the spread of the virus, but also we want to be responsive to the biblical mandate for us to assemble together. So this weekend, I want to give a huge thanks during this week through the changes and making sure communication happened to our great executive team, Brother Ulysses, Sister Shauna, and Sister Iris as well, and also a huge thank you to Brother Rudy for helping us pull together uh, this digital service today. Now, there are a few announcements that we want to make you aware of. First of all, our president has named today as a national day of prayer. So obviously in your home uh, during this service and at the end, we want you to engage in prayer with your family. But specifically, we're also calling for a special time of prayer together at our Azusa campus this evening from 6 to 7. At our Azusa campus, a time where we can gather together as a church and pray for our church, pray for our community, pray for our nation, and pray for our families. I encourage you to be there if you're physically in a position uh, to do so. Number two, I want to mention life groups. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're right in the middle of our semester of life groups, and these are extremely important, especially during a time like this. I've often wondered what would happen if the government came in and shut down our church and we were no longer able to have services. Would the church fall apart or would it continue to exist? And I want to let you know that the church would thrive because the church is not about a building or a weekend meeting. It's about brothers and sisters being together in the mission that God has called them to be and to do. So I'm encouraging you during this time where we hear a lot about social distancing so that we don't pass the virus uh, from one another. We need to be careful not to spiritually or emotionally become distant because the Bible mandates us to remain connected. So this week, your group leader is going to be reaching out to you with information about the group gathering this week. Listen, we need you to be a part of it. Your fellow group members need you. So I'm encouraging you to come together to encourage the other members of your group and also to provoke them to good works. Uh, and uh, these meetings are very important, especially during this time. The third announcement is next Sunday, we're hopeful to have a church gathering, but we're gonna need you to stay tuned to check social media. We're gonna be sending out emails and texts 
And the good thing about our Life Church app that Brother Geddes has been encouraging you every week to download to your phone, this is why. It's critical at a time like this because our app is updated immediately with the latest information. So stay connected during this time. And we'll let you know as soon as possible regarding the plans for this weekend. Hopefully we can communicate it through the groups and also the different means that we uh, just mentioned. But please also understand and be patient with us as we are responding to an ever-changing dynamic and certain situations that are beyond our control. And finally, I want to also remind you that during this time, it's important that you remain faithful to God, faithful to your uh, daily uh, devotion to the Lord. Uh, just because they've shut down the schools doesn't mean that you shut down your prayer life. And also remain uh, faithful in your tithes and offerings and support to the kingdom of God. In just a moment, we're going to go into another song of worship. And they're going to show you how uh, that up on the screen here, how that you can stay faithful in your giving during this time through a variety of digital formats. Uh, God bless you. Let's worship together with this song before we go into the word. Oh, you 
Amen. Praise the Lord. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Joshua chapter 9 and verse 12. We're going to read verses 12 through 15, and today I'm going to be reading this passage uh, from the NIV version. The Bible says this, This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you, but now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are, and our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The Israelites sampled their provisions, which means they ate their moldy dry bread that they had. It says the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. And for a few minutes today, I want to talk to you on this subject, moldy bread, moldy bread. Now, it's been an interesting week, to say the least. This coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, a worldwide pandemic, and then looking at our national and media response to it, it's something that I've never experienced in my 47 years of life, unprecedented. First of all, we have travel bans, and then uh, the uh, National Basketball Association uh, suspended their season, and then uh, the NCAA said that the uh, March Madness tournament was going to be canceled. And then before we knew it, the schools were shutting down and canceling some for two, some for three weeks. And then uh, what's been happening the last few days is uh, the stores have experienced a run on disinfectants and food staples. And for some reason, toilet paper. I haven't figured that one out yet. And uh, then we see, in terms of our economy, a lot of volatility in the market. And one thing that's happened that's impacted Life Church is our governor has recommended that we have no meetings over 250 people in an effort to uh, mitigate the spread, of the potential spread of this virus that uh, could prove very harmful, particularly to people who are older or in ill health. And as we mentioned earlier, the Covina School District early on the week let us know, hey, uh, we're going to limit the gatherings in the school property to no more than 100 people. And then they said, well, we're going to have to limit it to just 50 people. And then on Friday, they said, uh, we're not going to be doing any rentals of our school property uh, for the next two to three weeks. And I think it's crazy when I think, very interesting, that this tiny virus has uh, sent the whole world into a panic. And it's something we really haven't experienced in my lifetime, and particularly in recent years, we've kind of been immune to Americans, to anything that could disrupt our lives so dramatically. But when we look back through history, it's, it's nothing new. There have been pandemics over time and wars that have shook up nations and, and uh, uh, disrupted uh, whole societies and then major tragedies that have happened. But now you and I are facing a global situation that's affecting each and every one of us in one way or another. And during this time, we have a choice to make. As my wife mentioned at the very beginning, when we're faced with these types of uncertainties and concerns where a lot of people are perhaps overreacting, we have to make a choice. And the choice is, are we going to respond with fear or are we going to respond with faith? And as we preached about a few weeks ago, this response is going to be determined by the direction that we're looking. If our head is down and we're looking down, or if our head is up and we are looking up. We talked about if your head's down, you can only see the earth, which represents the physical. But if your head is up, then you can see the heavens, which is representative of the supernatural or the spiritual. Fear can only see the seen, but faith has the capacity to see the unseen. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, it says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. That means people of faith can see what others cannot see. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And uh, when we see people responding with fear or, or even with panic, when you look at the, the line at Costco, um, people trying to hoard and bring all these things into their home, and then normal people can't even go buy their groceries because uh, of this extreme fear because of the evidence that people see. When people act out of fear, they tend to make bad choices. When people act out of fear, uh, they often act in mass with other people's with other people, and the choices they make aren't always the best. Now, I love this uh, uh, acrostic or acronym for fear: F E A R. False evidence appearing real. And we have times like these where. There is a real situation. There is a real threat. There are real concerns. But as believers, we have an opportunity in times like this to show people our faith, that we're going to respond to this situation with faith and with a peace that really goes beyond the human ability to understand. And uh, so we want to choose not to be like the world and not to respond in fear. I read a quote the other day that a friend of mine, he said this, he said, fear elevates me above my rightful place and demotes God below his. When we fear, we are putting ourselves in a higher position and taking God out of his position into a demoted position. First Peter 5, 6 and 7 says this, Humble yourself, therefore, before or under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt thee in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So we humble ourselves by casting our care on him, but we become prideful when we carry our own concerns and our fears. You know, that's why the world panics. The world panics because they're trusting themselves. And we don't panic as believers because we understand our source is not our own ingenuity, our own capacity to gather things together and figure things out. Our source is Him, and that's what makes us different. Now, I was reading my Bible this week, and uh, I came across an interesting story that we read part of in Joshua chapter 9. To give you a little background for the story, God's people during this uh, reading in Joshua 9, we're in the midst of claiming the promised land. Moses had died, Joshua was now the leader, and they're moving in to the promised land, and the Lord commanded them to dispossess the land from all the evil, sinful Canaanites who used to live there. And so the instructions were to fully dispossess the land. But there was one group of Canaanites known as the, the Gibeons who heard about God's mandate, and they lived very close to where the Israelites were living in the land that they were claiming, and they knew basically, hey, we're next. We're about to be destroyed and pushed out of our land. And so they decided that their best option was to try to deceive God's people. So think about this. This is the enemy, the Canaanites, seeking to deceive God's people. Now, I hope you understand that even in 2020, our enemy, Satan, still wants to deceive God's people. So the Bible says that they resorted to a ruse. This was how they were going to deceive them. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. So they said, Hey, we're travelers. Look, we got old bread, old wineskins. Our clothes are worn out. Um, you can see our, our saddles are worn out. We, man, we've been on a long journey. We're from a long, 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 long way from here. So we just want to make a treaty with you. We heard about your God and all of his power. 
So basically, they're trying to pull a trick on him. Hey, we don't live next door to you. We're not the ones that you're about to dispossess. We're from a far country. They knew that if they could make a treaty with God's people, uh, then uh, they would be under oath and no longer able to fulfill what God's mandate uh, that they would push them out of their home and in their land. Of course, the, the uh, children of Israel were like, how can we be sure? How do we know that you're from a far distant country? And they said, as we read earlier, this bread was warm when we packed it. And uh, uh, on the day we came, we left to come to see you, but see how dry and moldy it is? These wine skins, now they're cracked. Our clothes and sandals are worn out from the long journey. And then the Bible says this in verse 14. This verse stood out to me. It's just like, beep, beep, beep. It said this, it says, the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it with an oath. What did they do? They made a treaty with the very ones God had told them to destroy. Now the point that I want to draw your attention to is that they made a bad decision. It was a faulty decision, and it was because they were tricked with false evidence. And the Bible says that they actually tasted the moldy bread. Think about that, this dry, moldy bread that they had made weeks before to try to fool them, they actually tasted it and they, were, uh, they tasted the evidence, this false evidence that was made to trick them, but they forgot to ask the Lord. The problem was they put too much confidence in the evidence and it was false evidence. We see the same thing earlier with Jacob when his sons brought to him the bloody coat of many colors that had belonged to his precious son Joseph and set it at his feet. The Bible says, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And what happened? He began to believe the false evidence and decisions were made with false evidence. And decisions made with false evidence are gonna be bad decisions, just like we see with Joshua and the children of Israel and then Jacob as he began to mourn. Now, Satan is our enemy and he's the enemy of God's purpose for your life. And he is a skilled manipulator of evidence. He uses propaganda to manipulate people, sometimes even believers. And we must understand that we can't live according to false evidence appearing real. Because if we do, we will act according to fear instead of faith. Because the whole time Jacob was mourning, Joseph was alive. God's plan was still unfolding. Joseph's dreams were being fulfilled and God was still on the throne the whole time. And in the meantime, Jacob's faith was down. His mood and his outlook for many years was impacted and shaped by false evidence. Now, the enemy's a really good liar. He takes a shred of truth. He takes some evidence. He takes some real things that are out there but he manipulates the evidence to convince us of the worst and to get us to act in, uh, in accordance to fear. And the sad part is, is we often are willing to taste the moldy bread rather than ask God what he has to say. So we have to make a choice. Are we gonna taste the moldy bread or are we gonna see what God has to say? Basically, are we gonna look through fear or are we gonna look through faith? Now, I want, I want to look real quickly here at what happens when we see through the eyes of fear versus what happens when we look through the eyes of faith. I got a great example here. It's in the book of Numbers chapters 13 and 14. That's when the children of Israel were about, they had the opportunity to go into the promised land and possess the promised land while Moses was still alive in a place called Kadesh Barnea. Now, some of you remember the story because they sent 12 spies in to spy out the land and they came back and they had reports about how hey it's a great land it flows with milk and honey there's huge fruit and grapes and and, and all of this wonderful sumptuous things 
And, uh, but when they came back, 10 of them came back with an evil or a negative report of the land and two of them came back with a good report because guess what? Two of them were looking through the eyes of faith and 10 of them saw all the same evidence, but they chose to look through the eyes of fear. Now the Bible shows us here what happens when you look through the eyes of fear, when you put all of your confidence in how the moldy bread, bread tastes. Number one, what happens when we look through the eyes of fear? Number one, we exaggerate our difficulties. We exaggerate the difficulties. Look at what it says, Numbers 13, 32. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Really? Everybody there was a giant? There was no kids, no young people? Was it really that way? Or are you exaggerating the difficulties? And when you look at your problems through the eyes of fear, they get bigger. And the more you look at the problem, the more exaggerated it gets. Let's say somebody criticizes you. The more you think about it, pretty soon you think the whole world's criticizing you. Isn't that how it works? When you look through the eyes of fear, it grows by proportion. Now, I also want you to understand that when you see a panic uh, and, and uh, kind of a majority opinion that kind of stirs everything up, the majority report is almost always negative. Anybody who's going to get something done in this world is going to have to go against the majority report because the majority of people are going to be looking with the eyes of fear and not of faith. Remember, it was 10 eyes of fear, two eyes of faith. People always trust the majority report because there are always more worriers and, and there always seem to be more naysayers and there's more critics and more fearful and more fretful and more negative people. And here's the problem. Negative attitudes become contagious and it continues to multiply until our difficulties are exaggerated. So the biggest problem, the first problem, is when we look through the eyes of fear, we exaggerate our difficulties. Look at the second thing that happens. The second thing that happens is we underestimate our abilities when we look through the eyes of fear. Numbers 13, 35, it says, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. That's kind of like an inferiority complex. Hey, we're just little bugs here. Yeah. And, uh, but, but here's another thing to think about. How did they, how did they know how they looked to the enemy? Oh, we looked the same to them. They thought we were grasshoppers too. How did they know? They didn't know. Uh, but what they were doing is they were projecting their fears on everybody else. And that's what they're doing here. They're projecting their fears. And when we look through the eyes of fear, we begin to underestimate what we can do and how God can use us to pull things together. The third thing that happens, this is why we gotta see what we're looking through. Which angle are we looking? The third thing that happens is we get discouraged. In Numbers 14, one, it says, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. Everybody got discouraged, defeated, uh, negative, whiny. And this is what happens when you look through the eyes of fear. This is why I'm saying, as Christians, we can't afford to follow the line and the way of thinking, the fear, because it's going to lead down this pathway. And then finally, what did they do in, in 14 and 2? They begin to gripe about their entire lives. It says, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we have died in the wilderness? You ever, you ever been there before? You kind of get a little bit negative and you're like, oh, it's just so terrible. I wish I wasn't even alive. I wish this hadn't happened. I, uh, I, I wish I had never met this person. I wish I never started this job. It's just we complain about everything in life. It's, it's a result. It's a symptom of when you look through the eyes of fear. And the last thing that happened in verse 3 is they eventually gave up and began to blame God. That's the end road of looking through the eyes of fear. That's why we can't afford to do that as the church says, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? The Lord did it to us.
God brought us here to kill us. Basically is what they're saying. And so this is the end result. This is where it leads when you look through the eyes of fear. It puts you in a bad spot. And you miss out on God's best and you're very likely to make bad choices when you look through the eyes of fear. The eyes of faith are so much better. Real quickly as we wrap this up, when you look through the eyes of faith, guess what happens? The opposite begins to happen. The first thing that happens is faith begins to shrink your problem. When you look through the eyes of faith, your problem doesn't look so big anymore. It gives you a brand new perspective. See, when you see your problems through the eyes of faith, you're looking at them from God's point of view. And then everything gets a whole lot more manageable when you look at it through God's point of view. Remember, we've been talking about the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but pray about everything. That, that's saying, in essence, it's not your worry to carry. Pray about it. Give it to him. Give it to God. You've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, you're a big God and you can handle this problem. So I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to let you work it out. I'm trusting you. I'm seeing through the eyes of faith. I'm not sitting home fretting, trying to figure out how I'm going to work this out. I'm seeing with the eyes of faith and I'm going to let you work it out. And then, then after you say that, then you can relax. And then you can say, well, how's it going to be solved? Hey, that's God's problem. It's not my problem. I gave it to him. I'm looking through the eyes of faith. It shrinks the problem. Genesis 18 and 14 says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard? too hard for the Lord? The answer is obviously no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Jesus says in Luke 1 37, he says, for nothing is impossible with God. Faith shrinks my problem when I look through the eyes of faith. The second thing is when I, when I look through the eyes of faith, when I speak faith, it opens the door for a miracle. In Mark eleven twenty two, 22, it says, have faith in God. If you have faith in God and you don't doubt, you could tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea, and it would. Whatever you ask for in prayer will be yours if you only have the faith. You could speak to a mountain and say, jump into the sea. That's an impossible situation. But God has set up the universe in such a way that there is a hierarchy of laws. And I want to tell you today that the law of faith is a higher law than even the laws of nature. God is a supernatural God. The law of faith can actually do more than the law of physics. And through faith, I want to speak to somebody today. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. It doesn't matter uh, how much fear you have or how bad that moldy bread tastes. Understand that there is a God who uh, through the law of faith gives us access to things more powerful even than the law of physics. Matthew 13, 58 said, Jesus did not do many miracles there in Nazareth because of their lack of faith. They didn't open the door for the miracles that the Lord had. When we look through the eyes of fear, I wonder how many doors were shutting. But when we look through the eyes of faith, when we lift up our heads, we open the door for God to work. And finally, faith gives me power to hold on in tough times. When I look through the eyes of faith, it gives me power to hold on. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, it says this, We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Look at what the scripture says. Even when the apostle indicated that he went through difficult times and he had questions that did not make sense. Anybody been there before? When he was persecuted, when he was made fun of, when he was cast down. All of these things happened, but he wasn't distressed. He wasn't in despair. He was not forsaken and he was not destroyed. Faith is a choice that gives us power to hold on, not just when things are good, but even when things 
are tough. And I think a key to faith that's unshakable is we've got to consider God at all times, not just our circumstances. If you only think about the negatives, you'll be discouraged. If you look through the eyes of fear, doubt will begin to creep in and it'll keep you from the best that God has for you. You know, we're really good at, at checking out the moldy bread. <laughs> the moldy bread. Oh, yeah, this is dry. This is moldy. This looks rough. We're really good at examining the facts. And I'm not telling you to ignore the facts. I mean, they needed to look through the wineskins and the bread and all of that. But I think it's important not just to look at the facts, but to change your focus to what God has to say. Inquire of the Lord. In the natural, something may seem impossible. Maybe you have a health situation. But I want to tell you that God's law supersedes the laws of medicine, the laws of science, and the laws of finance. We're talking about God's power and faith. When you focus on feelings of discouragement and loneliness, you may not be able to foresee anything good that's going to happen in your life because your head is down. But I want to tell you that your best days are ahead. Listen to me right now. I want you to get this in your mind. Get this way of thinking. To get your eyes off of fear and into faith. Say, God, I've considered the facts. I've looked at the charts. I've sniffed the moldy bread. I've looked at the projections and the analysis. It doesn't look good. But God, now I'm changing my focus and I'm considering you. I want to hear what you have to say. Because our lives will move in the direction of our thoughts and even more powerfully in the direction of our words. In James chapter 3, the Bible compares our tongue to the rudder of a ship. The rudder is a small thing, but it determines the direction and the destiny of a ship. Same is true with our words. If we speak fear, if we speak words of failure, we're going to end up living a defeated and a discouraged life. It's an important time. You got to watch your mouth during these times because negative words will keep you from being the person that God wants you to be. Because if you speak something long enough with passion, eventually your mind will begin to act on it and do whatever's necessary to bring it to pass because your tongue is like a rudder. And we have to be, folks, particularly careful what we say during times of adversity and hardship and uncertainty when things aren't going our way. Because the more positive your thoughts and words are, the stronger you're going to be through the trial and the sooner it'll be over. I really believe that. So guard what you say even closer during times of trouble because during these times of uncertainty, you could become vulnerable and you could slip into a negative attitude. So I encourage you, speak faith. Look through the eyes of faith. Change your mindset. And I also encourage you to stay connected to the body of Christ meaningfully. I'm glad you watched this today. Now I need you to go be a part of your group because when you connect with the brothers and sisters, they're gonna reinforce this. They're gonna encourage you because you're around a lot of fearful people, your coworkers, your friends, family members. If they're not believers, they're gonna default to the 10 negative spies. And I'm encouraging you, get around the people that are speaking faith and then you can start looking through the eyes of faith. So I'm encouraging you, stop tasting the moldy bread. Turn CNN off, turn Fox News off, and let's hear what God has to say. Hey man, I wanna pray with you right now. I feel the presence of the Lord here, and I believe that God wants to let his spirit minister to your household. And when you go out into a dark world, when you go down into a world that's fearful, you can come out of your home, which is a sanctuary, and, and you as a priest of your home, take out of that place a different attitude, a different mindset, a different perspective. So let's pray for that. Lord God, I pray for this household today. I'm praying your blessing on it. I'm praying, Lord Jesus, it would be a household of faith, of positive expectations, Lord Jesus. And, and while the world all around us, we see uh, heavy clouds and, and, and kind of a foreboding environment and words and thoughts and 
fears and concerns. It's all around us, Lord. And we'll look at the facts. We'll look at the evidence, Lord. But we're not going to sit there and eat a full bag of moldy bread. We're going to hear what you have to say. And in the name of Jesus, let our choices, Lord God, let our decisions, let our words, let our mindset, let our expectation be impacted by your word and not by the evidence we see around us solely. And in Jesus' name, I pray your favor and your anointing on this house. As moms and dads pray for their kids right now, let your blessing be upon them, Lord God. And during this season, over the next couple weeks, the kids home from school, let the, let the household, let this home, Lord God, be a place uh, of dedication and commitment, not a place uh, uh, where the filth of the world is talked and watched and observed, but let it be a sanctuary, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Anoint this house, anoint this home, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray this, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for church today. And once again, we're going to be gathering together at six o'clock tonight at our Azusa campus for a time of prayer. Just for one hour, come from six to seven. We're going to connect with the Lord. And we believe that in this time, it could be a time of revival. You say, how can you have revival? You, can't, you don't have access to your building. Hey, that's the way they did it in the, in the New Testament. Let's let God prove it again. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Why don't you just lift your hands toward your father right now?